Stand on your feet. Let's get to it. Matthew chapter 1, everybody. <clears throat> Are you ready for Christmas? Say amen. amen. If you aren't ready now, deep weeds you are. Matthew 1, 18 through 23. <clears throat> We're focusing on just the simple topic of Christmas. Yeah, but why did he do it? Why did he come to the earth? Verse 18, chapter 1 of Matthew. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. <clears throat> but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to, be, to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Could we pray before you're seated? Father, in Jesus' name, <clears throat> could we just pause an extra second and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the reason we celebrate today. Thank you that you cared enough, loved enough. It was in your sovereign plan to come and rescue your people. We were a mess. We were hopeless. There was no way out of our predicament. And there certainly was no way we could get to heaven unless somebody would come and rescue us. And Jesus, that's what you did. And not only did you come to rescue us in a one-time event, you sent the Holy Spirit that you might be with us forever and give us a down payment of the beautiful heaven that you have for us. You gave us a little bit of heaven to live with us every day. My prayer is, Father, that hope would be heard today. And, Father, that you would speak to everyone in the room, to the one who needs it the most. And Lord, I want you to speak to the one who thinks they need it the least. Help the preacher today. The sober responsibility of teaching your word, Lord, and the humble privilege is on me, and I pray you help me to do it with clarity and conviction. And may I honor you well today. And may the people honor you well by being attentive to what you're saying to the church. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Well, you may be seated, man. <clears throat> we celebrate this great year of Christmas, and Hannah came up and read the text when Gabriel visited Mary. We just read where Gabriel visited Joseph. When he visited Mary, uh, she was greatly, uh, what was the word? Was it disturbed? Troubled? You know, I've never had an angel visit me, so I, I feel like I probably would be disturbed or troubled myself. Some of you act like you'd sit down and have coffee with an angel. I don't see that in the scripture. I see everybody scared out of their mind. Anytime some of an angel, they just fell flat on their face, right? But she was troubled. And then when he started talking, it didn't help. <laughs> Mary, you're, you're going to have a son. And then immediately questions started rising up. And she had one big question. You don't know, somebody tell me what the question was. But How? And we focused on that question before. Her question was how, because even though she wasn't an expert on human sexuality, she got the gist of it. And she said, uh, how can I conceive if I've never been intimate with a man? And that's when the angel answered the question how, and he began to say, oh, this isn't a man thing. <laughs> this is a God thing. This is something God is doing for man, not something man's going to do to you. God has seen the great need of mankind, so he's going to bring himself to you, and the thing that's conceived in you will not be of flesh, but it will be of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to come on you, and, and that which is in you will be of him. So the angel answered the question, how? But I have another question today. I love answering the question, how? But I have this huge question of, but why? Why? I mean, we could go, why in so many, why her, why then, why to Jerusalem, why to Bethlehem, all those questions, but I want to turn the question why and it not be our questions, why here, there, and all that, 
but why would Jesus choose to come and go through all this? Why, what are the reasons that we have that Jesus, the king of the universe, the darling of heaven, the one in 100% 24-7 worship, the one who was self-sufficient all by himself, he had no need. He did not come because he needed to come, everybody. He did not gain anything or become more God because he came. He's God all by himself. He's self-sufficient. He wasn't more God because he became human. So it wasn't anything that he needed. I think to get us moving in the right direction, uh, we need to answer the question, why would he come? Well, it's not because he needed to. It's because we needed him to. It was all focused on our need. If you go to Philippians in, in your study time and you read that uh, Paul tells us we should have the mind of Christ in us and it goes through what he did, that he humbled himself and he became obedient. He, he took on the form of man even though he was completely God. Even though he was God, he didn't consider his godness something to be held on to, but he relinquished that. Not his godness, but he, he let go of heaven and his privileges to come and take on the form of a, of a man. All that... For us, he didn't need to do it. We needed him to do it, right? So I just looked through the scripture, and thankfully, the Bible clearly says in, in, numerous, in numerous places, he came, literally said, he appeared, or he manifested, or he came to, and it gives us the answer to our entire sermon. Why did he come? So if I get to five, five, but I'm at least getting to four. I feel confident about four. Uh, number one. The first reason Jesus came to earth and we celebrate Christmas is he came to fulfill the words of his prophets. He came to fulfill the words of his prophets. If you're still in our text, hopefully you haven't closed it up yet, the, uh, the angel visits Joseph, goes through this with him, says, hey, don't be scared to take Mary uh, as your wife. What's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. But on the screen, verse 21 through 23, she will give birth to a son, give him the name Jesus, 22. Look at verse 22. All this, is it up there? Keep going until verse 22. No, nope, go backwards, go backwards. I'm going to read it right here in the text. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Matthew 1, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. In other words, Gabriel's come down, he's talked to Joseph, and Matthew clearly says, if you want to know what's going on, the first thing that's going on is all this that we read took place so that the prophet's words would be fulfilled. He came because there were prophets of the Old Testament throughout the centuries that had prophesied that he would come. The first thing God is doing says, I am going to honor the word I've given to my people for centuries. And there wasn't just one prophet. He was talking about Isaiah right here when he's talking about the name Emmanuel. That, that's Isaiah's words. But there are, I read, I didn't count them, over 300, up to 350 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled with his birth, life, and death. 350. For example, Moses, when he was writing about Abraham, he says, Abraham, the world's going to be blessed through you. Why? Because he prophesied that the Messiah would come from Abraham's seed. Isaiah, the one we're reading about in Matthew, prophesied that a, a virgin would give birth to a son and that he would come through the lineage of Jesse and he would be Emmanuel, God with us. Micah prophesied that this baby would be born in Bethlehem. Uh, then you go to Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied that at the time of Jesus' birth, there would be great wailing in the land because a wicked ruler would be killing babies at the same time Jesus was born. Hosea prophesied that Joseph would take his son Jesus to Egypt to protect him from the onslaught that was going on by Herod. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy, and Jesus fulfilled every single one of them. Now, we, we say that, we, we nod, we mentally assent, but this is a pretty big deal. The number of prophecies that are fulfilled by one man. I read there's a, there was a, a great mind. His name was Dr. Peter Stoner. And he had a PhD in astrophysics, which is already, it's already blowing my mind just saying astrophysics, right? And then he also had a master's in biblical theology. He took it upon himself to figure out the odds at which one man could fulfill, and he only chose eight 
prophecies of the Messiah. Just eight, not 308. For the chances of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies of his birth and life and death. And he came up with this crazy number. So to help you out, it's one times 10 to the 28th power. And if you're not mathematically minded, that's not going to help you. So here, let me help you. A million is one times 10 to the 6th power, which simply means there's six zeros after the one. One in a million is a long shot. Everybody say amen. amen. The chances of one man fulfilling these eight prophecies Dr. Stoner came up with is not one plus six zeros. It's one in one with 28 zeros. Extra quadrillion, brillion, frillion, zillion is what that number is. If you're wondering, you can look it up and confirm that. One man fulfilling all the prophecies of the Old Testament about the Messiah coming, there was no chance it could happen unless God did it. And every time we come together for Christmas, and I hope every time in your family gatherings when we're celebrating the Christ child coming, I hope it also does a, an affirmation in your heart that what God's word says is true. If he said it in Exodus and Genesis through Moses, if he said it through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, if he said it and he brought it to pass, every Christmas we can get this book and say, I know one thing, everything written in this book is true. And in a world where there are preachers who are trying to diss parts of it, uh, minimize parts of it, focus on what Jesus said, not what everybody else said, they're trying to teach our students in seminaries to doubt parts of it, I want to stand flat-footed and say, if God spoke it, it comes to pass. Not one of God's promises have failed, and not one of his promises have yet to come will fail. He did come like he said he would come. Oh, I feel my help coming on. And he will come back again as he said he will come back again. He has prepared a place for us so that where he is, we will be there also. Evil will be defeated once and for all. All the promises are yes and amen. In who? In Christ. Jesus fulfilled everyone. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two. Well, if we're going to do it, we got to do better than that. Hallelujah, we'll do it, right? You see how much influence three people can have? Three people clap, and I'm like, that ain't good enough. We're just going to all have to clap. Why did he come? Number two, he came to atone for our sins. We had a problem that we were helpless to fix. From conception, everybody say, I'm listening. From conception, you didn't do anything. You didn't lie about the chocolate chip cookie and get you in trouble when you were two. You were in trouble when conception, you were in trouble. I started to do a little biological a little lesson, but I chose not to. The Bible literally says, I think it was the psalmist that said, I was conceived in iniquity. I didn't learn how to sin. I was created in sin. So when we come out of the mother's womb, we didn't have, we were defective. You need to go home and look in the mirror and just tell yourself, you were a mess. We were broken. We weren't perfect. Now, I know if you just had a baby, oh, it's perfect. I know that they're not old enough to let you know just how imperfect they are. But when they're old enough to start talking and doing stuff, you're going to realize that perfect little baby in your was not perfect, not at all. No, nay, nary, not a bit. Because we were conceived in sin and we were helpless to fix ourselves, no matter how much we tried. From the very first sin that we see in, in, in man, Adam and Eve, you know, the tree, don't eat of the tree. If you do, you'll surely die, da, 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 da. And they took of the tree their first experience with shame and sin, the awareness of their sin, causes them to go in, I can fix this mode. I can make it better. They go and sew themselves clothing from fig leaves, trying to cover their nakedness. But when God comes to meet with them, the fig leaves are not adequate. He covers them with skins of animals, which there's a whole little lesson there in bloodshed and the atonement and all that. But what God was telling them, you can't, sew enough leaves together to cover what has happened here. Sin is not just hiding what you are. I mean, you can't fix sin by hiding it. Sin has to be dealt with by blood. And Jesus came so that our futile attempts at covering up ourselves would be an end so that he could come and give us a new beginning and atoning for our sins 
himself. Adam and Eve try to do it. You, you graduate to the New Testament, and you see the Pharisees try to do it. It wasn't fig leaves, but it was religion. They said, we'll, we, here's what we'll do. We'll work harder. We'll pray more. We'll fast more. We'll, we'll wear the right clothes. We'll memorize the verses. We'll have uh, things on our doorposts. We'll go to synagogue when we're supposed to. We'll dot all our E's and dot all our I's and cross all our T's. I said, I knew that didn't sound right. Dot, we don't dot E's. Anyway, not in English anyway. And we'll, dot, we'll do all the things perfectly right. And we will fix this sin problem. We will be righteous enough. Only for Jesus to come, the Son of God, and come and say, you look like whitewashed tombs. You're all clean and beautiful on the outside, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones and all kind of wickedness. Meaning, still, the fig leaves aren't enough. Your righteousness is not enough. You've got a sin problem, and a sin problem doesn't need leaves. A sin problem doesn't need religion. A sin problem needs a Savior. And Matthew 121 says it just like this. The angel came and said, he will bring forth a son and he will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus in the New Testament is Yeshua in Hebrew. Yeshua means rescuer, deliverer, savior, his very name. From the time he was in conception, an angel was declaring the purpose of the Christ child that hadn't even been born yet. He will be Jesus. Why? Because he will rescue. He will deliver. And he will save his people. He's not even taking his first breath out of the mother's womb, but the angel is preaching about what this Christ child will be. He will deliver us from our sins. 1 John 3, 5. Look at, look at the way the Bible says it. You know that he appeared. When? In visible form as a man. Christmas. We know that Jesus came and appeared as a man. Why? In order to take away sins. He didn't come because he needed us. Everybody look at me. The Lord doesn't need me. That would mean he has lack. That would mean he has a need. God is self-sufficient. He has no need. He's not more God because the room is full this morning and it'll be filled a couple more times or because church is all over the world. He is not more God because millions are honoring him. No, he's honored because he's worthy of that. He would be God all by himself. He didn't come because he needed us. He came because we needed him. We needed to be rescued. Number three, not only did he come to atone for our sins, he came to know, I love this one, to nullify the works of the devil. Look at what John said in his epistle in 1 John. He says, we know that the Son of God came, there you go, was manifest in other versions to destroy the works of the devil. Now, if you're not up on the spiritual battle we're all in, let me just quickly tell you, you're in one. And the Bible is very clear. There are two agendas for people who want our souls. John 10.10, 10, the thief, the enemy, Satan, the dragon, the serpent. He comes to steal, kill, destroy. That's his agenda. If you're not living for Jesus, you're under the influence of your enemy. He comes to steal, kill, destroy. He's coming to rob you. Rob you of health, rob you of peace of mind, rob you of your relationships. He's come to kill you, to kill your, to kill your marriage, to kill your health and well-being. He's come to destroy you by addiction, by your own self-destructive patterns. He's come to kill, steal, destroy. That's what one person's agenda is. But somebody else came along, and when Jesus born, but here's why I come, the Lord said. I come that you might have life. And have it abundantly. There's two agendas. And you're going to be on one page. Choose your page, man. You're going to be on the steal, kill, destroy page or the life more abundant page. Most of us in this room have signed up for the life abundant page. Come on, somebody. How do I do that? You say, you know what? I'm tired of doing life my way. I'm tired of doing life independently of the Savior. I want to surrender my life to Christ and give him all that I am, past, present, future. My sins, but also my good, good mornings, my bad mornings. My F I want to give him everything. And then God says, I've come to give you life and life to the full. I want to be on that page. But the enemy still works against us even when we're on this page. What's he trying to do? He's trying to... Steal, kill, destroy. The enemy that is seen in so many of our lives in so many ways. 
the drugs and the alcoholism, the eating disorders, the anxiety that keeps us up at night, the depression that keeps us in bed in the morning, the divorce courts that are full, all of these things is just manifestations of sin and how the enemy is destroying us. But the Lord says, but I have come. What did John say? He came that he might destroy. The word in the Greek is luo, L-U-O. It means to nullify, dissolve, to make disappear. He came that the works of the devil would be nullified, annulled, brought to nothing as if it didn't happen. Come on, somebody. He came to nullify the works of the devil. Got a, a brief testimony on the screen. If you would take a look at this video of Miss Tracy. Can you just kind of you got a lot on your heart? You want to start at the beginning? Okay. And just tell us. All right. What In 2010, my youngest daughter Hannah passed away on my eldest daughter's birthday. I was convict or charged and convicted of her death. Her autopsy results were that she had my prescription medicines in her system. But when I got out, I had began a same-sex relationship and continued that when I got out. And my addiction and the destruction in my life just continued and I started selling and using crystal meth while on probation and on a routine parole check, I was, um, they found 18 grams of methamphetamine. And while I was in there, I, um, I prayed to God. I said, God, you know, I feel like this connection with this person is right. So show me what's wrong. And that didn't happen right away. But as I would read and do my studies, scripture would pop out and be like, here it is, you asked for it. And as soon as I got out, I realized I need to run. Could you maybe in just a sentence or two share what you were and what you are now? What I was was a hot mess, um, drugs, and sexual immorality not focused. What God has done now is focused me, opened my heart, and brought me joy. He's forgiven me for the things that I've done. And there's no greater feeling in the world than to know, no matter what, that he's there. There's, he provides, but it's just the peace that he gives today that I wouldn't change for anything and take it back and go back to that chaotic destruction. Sorry. Come on, give it up for Miss Tracy. <clears throat> Tell you a little bit about her. She, uh, an employer told her about the church. She got connected with us and just, uh, she, she's moved to Kentucky uh, to be closer to children and family, if I'm remembering right. She said, but before I leave town, I want to share my testimony with the church. And I said, man, yeah, let's get that on video before you get out of here, you know? And uh, she's, it's actually, that was just a, an abbreviated version. We're going to throw it out on social media. We're starting a campaign called Point Up. And it's the reason we point up is what God has done in our lives. And we want to hear not just her story, but other stories of how God has brought people 
out of what the enemy was doing in their life. And I just want you, you to get a glimpse of this. Right there where the Hewitts are sitting, she was sitting right around in there giving this testimony. You have no idea who's sitting beside you and what they're going through. But I know one thing. There's no room for arrogance or haughtiness in this building. Uh, the pastor of this place needed grace more than anybody in this place needed grace. You don't know who's going to be sitting in your seat in the next service. They may be a hot mess just like Tracy was, but they're going to hear the message that Tracy just preached, that the Son of Man came and he appeared, that he might destroy the works of the devil in her life. See, here's what happened. God came to nullify what the enemy tried to do. I'm remembered of uh, the story of Joseph in Genesis chapters 37 through 50. He lived in a godly home. He had a godly father. He was favored. He had a dream. He was going to be an influencer. And yet then the enemy began to work through his brothers. They hated him. They envied him. They wanted to kill him. If it wasn't for one of his brothers, they would have killed him. But instead, his brother talked him out of that and sold him as a slave. Now he's a, in human trafficking. The story goes on. He was lied on. He, he was... Accused of raping a woman, he didn't rape, he was landed in jail even though he was innocent. And all these years, about two decades worth of the enemy seeming to have his way. And God raised him up to be the prime minister of the entire country. His brothers come and they're begging for food because they need food, but they don't know it's his brother until Joseph said, don't you recognize me? I'm the brother you sold into slavery years ago. They panic. They're scared out of their mind what he might do to them. And he says, hey, hey, hey. Just breathe, because here's the message. You intended it for evil. You and the enemy working through you wanted to hurt me, wanted to harm me, wanted to kill me. But what you intended for evil, God came and he meant it for good. He brought me out, but he didn't just bring me out because of me. He brought me out so I could be a blessing to so many others. The works of the devil was this, but God appeared so that he might nullify the works of the devil. The enemy appeared that he would steal from Tracy, rob her of her family, destroy her life by methamphetamines and sexual immorality. But then she found Jesus, or should I say Jesus found her, and Jesus came and nullified all that the enemy wanted to do and gave her forgiveness and atonement and restoration. And I just believe that God is going to restore everything in her life that the enemy tried to destroy. Come on, somebody. Can we honor the Lord for coming to destroy the works of the devil? And then number four, he came to seek and save the lost. <clears throat> he came to seek and save the lost. We heard Matthew say he came to fulfill the words of the prophets. We heard Matthew say his name would be Jesus, the Savior of sins. We heard John say that he appeared, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So we've heard from Matthew and John. What about hearing from Jesus himself? Why did I come? And he actually answers that if you'll look on the screen. Jesus said that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. From his own mouth, you want to know why I'm here? This is my mission to seek and save the lost. I know we're full of, uh, a room full of a lot of church people. I would say the majority of us are heaven bound. We're on our way to glory. But I think it's very important for us to remember, even as church, hand raising, singing, blood bought, on our way to heaven people, it's a, it's a, a hugely valuable thing for us to keep in front of us the sinfulness that he saved us from. The fact that we're not going to heaven because we're smarter, better, more righteous, more dedicated, or more loving than anybody. That's not why we're going to heaven. We're going to heaven because the Savior came to us in our messed up situation when we were, while we were powerless and while we were still unworthy in our sin, Christ died for us. That's why we're on our way to heaven. <clears throat> and it would behoove every Christian to keep that front and center. It should never grow old for a believer to hear a message on salvation, grace, or the cross. We should, it, should, it should never, I've heard this before, blah, 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 preach me something. We should never get to that. Because if we don't keep the cross, our sinfulness, our hopelessness without the cross, front and center... Everybody say, I'm listening. We tend to drift toward saved by works 
justified by works. We don't mean to. Nobody's dumb enough to mean to do that. Because we know the Bible says we're saved by faith alone, by grace alone. But if we don't keep the cross front and center, if we don't keep the fact that we were lost without and front and center, we'll drift toward, well, I pray more than they do. I go to church. I've been giving for years now. And I've been singing up on that stage for years. And I've been doing small groups for years. And I'm on my way to heaven because I live right. And I love holiness. That's, why I'm, that's not why you're on your way to heaven. You're not on your way to heaven because you did anything. Oh, God help me. You're on your way to heaven because what you couldn't do, he came and did for you. A price you couldn't pay, he paid for you. Sin you couldn't cover up and atone for, he atoned for you. And we ever lose sight that if it hadn't been for Jesus, we'll be lost. The old hymn said, lost and undone without God or his son. Hopeless. That's why we need to keep this message in front. He came to seek and save. That's why Christians need to keep that in the front of the mind. But how about the people who aren't yet saved? Well, I've got great news for you too. Because there's people in the room, you're still bound in your sin. There's people watching online, you're still a skeptic or a cynic. There's still people when we lift our hands, they like to pick apart what a worship service is. What are they doing? They're fake. Still people in the room that don't know Jesus. That are lost. Do you know what the Bible says about us? Can I depress you before I encourage you again? Let me depress you. Here's what the Bible said about you before Jesus saved your soul. And me. You were blind. You were deceived. You were poor. You were wretched. You were naked. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were an object of God's wrath. You literally made the holiness of God angry. You were hopeless. You were as far away from saved and as heaven as you could be. No amount of things you could do. You were hopelessly lost until Jesus came. That's what you were pre-Jesus. You know what you are post-Jesus? When you get on the page of life abundantly, you're found. Your eyes are opened. You're cleansed. You're holy. You're pure. You're the righteousness of God. You're no longer poor. You're, you have the riches of his grace. God help us. And we're not objects of his wrath. We're objects of his grace and his pleasure because when he sees us, he sees his son. <clears throat> I, there's, a, there's an image, a meme or picture going around social media. I had to steal it. I kept looking at it. It just hit different one day. Even though it's a little blurry, there's a shepherd with desperation running at the one that was lost. He says, I've come to seek and save the lost. And I'm, I, don't, I, I hope none of us ever lose the humility of this, but I just want to publicly testify that I am thankful that he leaves the 99 and he chases down the one. I am thankful 2007 through 2012 because I was in that up and, down, up and down stupid phase all those years actually 2005 man I was stupid for 7 years anyway in that period of time while, while 99 preachers were being faithful to his word 99 preachers were living pure 99 preachers were doing what God had called them to do 99 preachers were saying no to stupidity and temptation there was one as lost as a ball in high weeds and you're looking at him and I'm thankful that we have a savior who's a shepherd though there's 99 doing what they're supposed to do he's still got his eyes and his heart on the one who's out there lost and ruining their life and if you're that one this morning I want you to know there's a savior who came to seek and save the lost his eyes are on you he's looking he's chasing he's pursuing stand on your feet. I was afraid I wouldn't get to the fifth one. But for you people who love to fill in blanks, he came the first time so you would be ready for him to come the second time. Can I just preach just a minute on that? We can celebrate the Advent and Christmas right now, which we should. We're celebrating his first coming, but our eyes should be on 
his second. The first coming means nothing if he's not coming back. <laughs> Listen to me. He didn't come just to live 33 years with us on earth. He came so that we could live in eternity forever with him. He's coming back. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you for, thank you for the reason for this day and tomorrow and this whole season. God with us. Why did you do it? Lord, you answered it straight in your word. You did it to show us the words of the prophets are true. That your word can be taken just as you spoke it. You came to atone for our sins, something we were helpless to do on our own. You came to nullify and destroy the works of the devil. To reverse the curse that the enemy put on us. Like you did in Tracy's life. You came to restore and forgive. You came to seek and save the lost. Father, I pray... Could it be that you'd find somebody in this room today that they would reach up their hand and say, Lord, I need you to save me. Would you do it today, Lord? We give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus.